Hello everyone, my name is Paul Third, and I have been umming and eyeing on whether to make this video, it is very controversial, I'm holding up a mirror to YouTube, to me, to other audio engineering YouTubers and to you watching this right now. Many of you are not going to like a lot of the stuff that I'm going to say in this video but I personally think it's very important to really have an honest discussion as a community because I do genuinely believe that the way that I see it going, the audio journey is being dumbed down. And the audio journey has always been something that has always been kind of, you know, very sacred. And many people will be like, Paul, what's the audio journey, right? Now, it's different to other people, but the way that I've always seen the audio journey is it starts with audio science. So, for example, right, if we think about from, like, old to, like, modern, right? It started off with, like, um, in terms of guitars, like Les Paul, uh, in terms of audio engineering, again, Abbey Road, you know, the engineers at EMI, they made the Fairchild, they made the consoles, they modified, you know, the Altec compressors to make the RS-124. Then you've got the electrical engineers like Rupert Neve that basically, like, engineered <laughs> the sound of modern records and then influenced everything else that came, you know, after it. And then from there, so it's like tiers. I see it as like a tier of audio <laughs> learning. So the audio science guys who like made all the technology to get the most out of music. Then it tears down to the audio engineers who took that technology and that learning and were able to put it into practice. So we think about our kind of OG recording engineers. All engineers who understood a lot of the science that was going on but had the creative knowledge to be able to put it into practice and to merge the two worlds. And really, the two worlds couldn't coincide without the other. And then those guys influenced the mixers that we know today. It basically started off with Bob Clear Mountain. Bob Clear Mountain, for anybody that doesn't know, was really <laughs> the OG mixers mixer. He almost kind of invented the need for mixing engineers. And then from obviously Bob Clear Mountain, he then inspired basically all the famous engineers that we look up to today. And that also includes all of the mastering engineers, all the OG mastering engineers that mastered all these famous mixers. And then those original engineers then inspired the modern wave of engineers that we have today. All of these engineers have a solid foot in the past and were heavily inspired by the people that came before them. And in regards to a lot of the conversations that I've had with industry mixers, that journey is something that they never forget. And, you know, you'll start off with, like, the, the OG mixers, and then when you get the OG mixers, you'll then hear them talking about guys like Bob Clearmountain. Then you'll hear them talking about Bruce Swedean. And then you'll find Bruce Swedean talking about audio science. You know, all these, like, really clever electrical engineers. It's a journey of very talented people that have essentially crafted the sound that we have today of modern records. And that there is, in my opinion, essentially, the audio journey. And what I love about the audio journey is that as the technology has, has advanced and the genres have advanced and music has changed and technology has changed, the audio journey has essentially stayed the same, but it's just progressed. And, you know, different engineers have came along and taken those learnings and advanced them, you know, with the modern techniques of today, you know, Jason Joshua, you know, being a big example of that. However, the issue was for many years that that journey was essentially gatekept. Like, it was essentially, you know, all of this kind of knowledge that we have today, like, years and years ago, the only way you were able to get all of that knowledge and understanding was by interning and by putting in the work to get yourself in the right places and to speak to the right people and, you know, to engineer in as many studios as you could and, you know, to read books. Oh my God, read books, yes, behind the glass, recording engineer's handbook, mixing engineer's handbook. And Bobby Osinski, like, did us a massive favour by, you know, like, having conversations with all of these, like, famous engineers, experienced engineers, sorry, not famous, experienced, that's an important point that I'll come to later. These resources were honestly like gold dust. And slowly, that information all of a sudden was kind of less gatekept. And I would say kind of the, the change of the guard almost kind of started with Pensado's place. Now, for anybody that doesn't know, Dave Pensado is, you know, a fantastic mixing engineer, one of the great OGs, as I said earlier. J. 
Jason Joshua, who we all know. Again, I've like been at a masterclass at Abbey Road just to listen to Jason Joshua's mixing technique and his approach. You know, he learned everything that he learned, he says, from Dave Pensado. And what Dave Pensado done for the very first time on YouTube was to get the biggest mixing engineers in the world who hardly ever <laughs> had spoke about their craft. Maybe they did They did the odd, like, Sim Done Sound, you know, article. Yes, there was times when... <laughs> these are times when you genuinely had to go through articles to find out what mixers were doing. But what was great about Pensado's place was that it used an accessible platform that was YouTube. And for the very, very, very first time, you are getting like diamond, gold dust interviews with like some of the best engineers on the planet that never would hardly do any interviews. Spike Stent, um, CLA did quite a few. Jack Joseph Puig's one is amazing. Tony Maserati, Joe Ciccarelli, you name it, right? All the big mixers they had on that show. And I remember, like, I would watch every episode and I would watch them over and over and I would take notes because the information that these engineers were giving was, like, basically, like, little, little glimpses of what you needed to do to be at their level. But, right, as good as that was, the issue with, you know, an hour-long video that was sometimes interviews would maybe only be like 45 minutes long. The issue with that was that you cannot get the entire audio journey from one person and you can't do it in 45 minutes. Fuck, you can't even do it in fucking 24 hours. It's impossible. It's a journey and it's all about experience. However, as good, as honestly good and amazing as it was to like get a glimpse into the industry, the issue with this content, was that it was all surface layer. Now, what I mean by surface layer is, essentially I see everything as layers, and there's always context behind everything in life, right? You can see something for what it is, or you can choose to look back and, you know, right, what does that actually do? Why does that do what it do? How does it do what it do? And why was it created? For example, right, let's see um, Leapwing Stage 1, right, the depth function in that plugin. I use it all the time. Now, I could be a simpleton and just sit back and go, Yeah, depth, yeah, I know what depth is. It creates depth. Yeah, it sounds amazing. I just use, I just put the, the, the slider up in, yeah, depth, baby. Yeah, I'm an engineer. Mwah. Fucking gun show. Now, I could have done that, and I think most people do that, but me being me, I was like, no. Like, what is it actually doing? Because at the end of the day, that's an expensive plugin, and I'm the type of guy <laughs> where, you know, if I'm not getting it for free, I'm like, I'm not fucking paying that money, <laughs> so I want to find out what it does. So I found out what it is, and I read a manual. <gasps> oh my god, reading a manual? <laughs> I know, it's crazy how, like, reading a manual is like, oh my god, what a geek, <laughs> reads a manual. It's genuinely geeky to read manuals these days. And what I found was that it was manipulating early reflections. So I'm like, right, okay, so surface layer, depth. Next layer, you've got Right, so what's, what is it doing? Right, okay, that's okay. That's how it's creating depth. It's by manipulating early reflections. And that's all well and fine and great and dandy. But why had they decided to put that in this plugin? What inspired them to put that function in the plugin? Well, then if you peel back another few layers, you'll find engineers like Jason Joshua. So when I was at Abbey Road at his masterclass, he was talking about creating depth by manipulating, manipulating early reflections. I think he was using... Waves true verb to do this. And most likely, who did he learn that from? Probably Dave Pensado. Okay, again, we're going back, okay, in the journey. And where did Dave Pensado probably pick that up from? I would probably say it was from Bruce Swedean because Bruce Swedean was very, very famous for, I don't know if he did create the technique, but from, from what I've read, he was one of the early adopters, we'll say early adopters of the technique. And he did it physically with microphones. Now, he did it physically with microphones. Now, how did he know <laughs> uh, how to, like, muck about with microphones and how did he get to that point where he was like, oh, if I record things a certain way and I um, put the mics in a certain positions, I can create depth by manipulating early reflections. How did he know how to do all that? Because he understood audio science. And this is something that, you know, I get, like, slated for because, like, oh, music's creative, you know, fucking science. 
Everything revolves back to science. Everything that we do, there's a science behind it. And that's the surface layer. So we've just, I've just given you a little audio <laughs> lesson there. So we went from just like one feature and a plugin all the way back to where it started, all the way back to audio science. We peeled back the layers. We, we went back 60 years <laughs> to Bruce Wedean. Is it 60 years? 50, 60 years, I think. Uh, and then we went all the way back to audio science. That there is the audio journey. And that's how, you know, the audio journey has advanced. Techniques that very, very clever people, you know, had adopted had then been taken on by people who were then able to, to take that same technique and utilise it with the technology that was available. Where we have now with stage one, where it's available for everybody. However, as great as that sounds, and as, as much as I want to believe that that's the way it's going to be for the rest of time, it's sadly not. <laughs> that way anymore because unfortunately most of you have became addicted to surface layer content you just don't want to do the journey you just don't want to put in the legwork you have essentially became addicted to YouTube which is the platform for surface layer content for audio and that essentially is slowly, slowly, slowly more every day Dumbing down the audio journey, dumbing down the audio community, dumbing down the future of audio production, dumbing down the future of the next big engineers. And as sad as it is, we have to accept it. YouTube is dumbing down the audio journey. But why is that? Well, I would kind of say it's basically kind of two big reasons. This is where I start holding up a mirror to me, but also to you. Let's hold the mirror up to you first. <laughs> Sorry. But I have to say it, right? One of the biggest reasons that the, the audio journey is dumbing down is because of attention span. We live in a world of, you know, TikTok, where, and YouTube shorts and Instagram reels, where you're getting used to, you know, not being able to almost focus for longer than fucking six minutes <laughs> at a time. You're so used to fast food content and you want to learn everything in one sitting, and you don't want to have to do anything else. You essentially just want to turn up, get what you need, fuck off, and that's you. You're amazing. You're awesome. And the YouTube algorithm knows this. It's a very, very crafty beast. It's the master of being able to keep you stimulated, but not overwhelm you. It knows what content to give you. It watches, almost watches your every move, genuinely. All the statistics work in a way to allow the, the algorithm to give you content that you want. And unfortunately, what me and many other YouTubers are finding is that you don't want over-technical stuff, you don't want overwhelmed, you want it really broken down, but you want it fast hack and fast food, and you want to walk away in that video just like, yeah, that's me done, I'm amazing. However though, however, I am going to say it's not just you, it's us as well, and again, YouTube again is to blame uh, for this next bit. <coughs> fucking Jesus. Bitch, bitch fucking coughed up a lung there. Oh, God, that's the only thing that's in the studio. Got this bit, it's like fucking, honestly, it's a bit like 12 week old red cola. Disgusting. However, however, right, it's not pinning the blame just on yous, right? We are to blame as well, the YouTubers, because a big part of why the audio journey has been dumbed down so much over the years is due to monetization and due to reviews. And unfortunately, it's something that I can't see getting any better because YouTube AdSense seems to get worse all the time. The algorithm is getting harder to work with. For most YouTubers, you're lucky if you get a two-day window. <laughs> like genuinely, you need to hit every single fucking metric. Click rate, your fucking retention, um, and even just fucking engagement, just getting people to comment and like it, it is it's all a cacophony of statistics and it's very hard. And, you know, you do everything right and it'll still fucking give you a two-day window. Because it's the, the platform is so overly saturated. And unfortunately, you know, it's something that's going to stay. Like the whole review thing, it's going to stay. Because unfortunately, that's what you all want. I have to kind of throw the mirror back to you and say the reason that the YouTubers are making these reviews are because that's what you are watching. What you've got to remember is that you now don't follow most YouTubers. They follow you. They follow your trends. They follow what you want to watch, and they'll just give it to you on a fucking silver platter. And you have to accept 
that when it comes to like audio videos, reviews are probably some of the most commonly watched. And this has unfortunately resulted in the audio journey essentially being monetized <laughs> and sold for profit. And to be honest, it was an eventuality. The writing was always on the wall for the audio journey because it was always going to happen. I mean, this all basically started with Waves. As soon as Waves made all of those signature plugins, right? The CLAs and the Jack Joseph Puig's and the Tony Maserati's and uh, blah, 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 the Greg Wells ones, you name them, you name them. You name a big engineer, they've probably got a signature plugin. Because before, if you wanted to, you know, learn about, you know, about the tools that these mixers used and, you know, how they used them and settings that they had, you needed to engineer in those studios. You needed to be, you know, sitting there <laughs> like a lurker, like like a cat, just, be just behind the desk, just like taking notes. <laughs> well, nobody notices. Sneak your way in. Where now, you know, with all these signature plugins, you, you didn't need to do any of that. You don't need to read books. Just buy the plugins and you'll sound like your favourite engineers. Amazing. However, you know, as we all know with the Wave Signature plugins, it was all surface layer stuff because, right, as good as all these settings are, right, without the context of how they're used and, you know, without the context of the entire chain, you know, you got to remember that like, if you could have, um, you know, like CLA bass or CLA vocals or whatever, like that chain works with everything else that he does on other tracks, guitars, drums, you know, bass, fucking strings, backing vocals, etc, etc. Like, without the context, the tool is fucking useless to you. Unless you figure out what it's doing, you know, which is something that I've been doing for years. Whenever I get a signature plugin, I stick it straight into Plugin Doctor, check it behind the hood, and I go, ah, all right, that's what they're doing, right? And then, again, I peel the layers back. However, people weren't doing that. <laughs> people were just buying Wave signature plugins and going like, yeah, presets, presets. And it created, you know, the, the what I call the preset addiction. And it, it, really, this is where the laziness started to kick in. People were just starting to believe that they could spend money on all these 30 quid fucking plugins and then they were just going to become amazing mixers. However, you know, what happened? All of these engineers gave away all of their secrets, right? All of their secrets. And somehow still managed to stay on top. And why was that? Because they had the context. They had the audio journey. They understood the context behind the tools. They understood the why, not the how. This is something that we have became absolutely consumed with now. We never want to know what the why is, we want to know the how. Just tell me how to do it, I don't need to give a fuck why I'm doing it. Just tell me how, just tell me who does it, how to do it, don't need to know the why, and I'll fucking do exactly that, and I'll be a fucking great engineer. <laughs> However, as much as these signature plugins are essentially a dumbed down version of the audio journey and, you know, we all know it was they were made purely for fucking monetization and profit. At least all of this stuff was made by the right people and all the information was coming from the right people. I mean, these people didn't make crippleware, right? They did genuinely give away tools that had the techniques that they were using. You know what I mean? However, did many of these guys use their signature plugins? Not really, but the information was there, and the, the audio journey was there, it was just that it was all surface layer. However, you know, we're at a point now where all of the information of the audio journey isn't coming from the right place now. It's almost as if, like, the audio community have become so conditioned to clickbait and all of this, like, the best mixing trick, and you need to do this, and the, and the secret hack, and the secret mix that you're, you're missing that's gonna make your fucking mixer master, like, the best it's ever been. It's almost like if you drip feed yourself all of these secret little mixing tricks, and all these secret little mixing hacks, and all these plug-in chains and vocal presets, that if you build them all, you can build them like a little tower, and they'll all just do it for you. You'll just get to sit back without any research and be like, yeah, let the plugins and the tools do it for me. Fucking yes, look at me. Newsflash, sorry to tell you, <laughs> but that technique will never, ever, ever get you to where you want to be. The reason why you're probably watching a lot of this content is because of your own insecurities. Unfortunately, social media has made us so fucking insecure and it's hard, it's genuinely hard to believe in yourself. And what I found is that that insecurity 
tends to breed a lot of laziness. You you get some people that are really insecure and you get you, you just get people that are lazy as shit. Because, you know, at the end of the day, let's face it, the reality is it's much easier to pin the blame on other people as to why your mixes and masters sound shit. It's not your fault. You took their advice. You took all of their advice. You did everything that they told you. Every single, <laughs> every single one of you. You used all the plugins. You're using thousands of fucking plugins. Okay, and computers melting. You know, your mix is still some shit, and you're like, not my fault. They told me to do it. I trusted them. I believed them. So guess what I'm gonna have to do now? <laughs> I'm gonna have to watch more content, and I'm gonna have to watch more people. And I'm going to have to get them to tell me how to fix all the shit that, that those people told me to do that I fucked up my mixes, but it's fine because I'll get there in the end. Hey, fuck the audio journey. I've got YouTube. I've got lots of surface layer content. I'll get there in the end. <laughs> but to make you feel a little bit better, it's not just you that's insecure. The fucking YouTubers themselves are insecure because you've got audio YouTubers now regurgitating other people's contents. Like genuinely taking like famous engineers and making their entire channel all about their audio journey, their tips and tricks. It's not first hand information anymore, it's fucking second, third, fourth. <laughs> it's information that came from a guy on a forum that knew a guy that sat in the studio with a famous engineer, or knew a guy who knew a guy who met him doing the boozer, <laughs> who was in a studio with CLA when he done a record. Couldn't even tell you what fucking record that was, but I was there and that's what he did, yeah. Telling you right now, that's that's the compressor setting of CLA. And it's just getting fucking boring. Like, let CLA tell his own audio journey. You don't need to tell it for him. And how do we even know that, that what they're even saying is fucking good information? We don't. But we just trust. This is the problem. We just trust people way too easily. And I'm sorry to say it, right? See the people right now that are getting tons of views and lots of subscribers by regurgitating stories from other famous engineers. I'm sorry, but like, what fuck are you doing? Like, how are you ever going to become a successful engineer if you just make videos about other fucking people? It makes no sense. Like, how, how is that helping your journey? How are you helping your audience? It genuinely just comes from a place of insecurity. Because what many modern YouTubers understand is that, oh, we don't have the credibility to give information, but he does. And it's much more easier to give credible information if you tie a famous engineer to it, which makes me credible. The blind leading the blind. <laughs> Fantastic. And that's where we are just now, right? Even like the, the OG audio YouTubers have essentially bled that fucking well dry, right? They've built their career on giving amazing information and their experience of the audio journey. Again, most of the big engineers have all shared the audio journey. They all have a foot in the audio journey and they've done a great job at sharing that. Some over fucking 10 years. But the problem is when you do this for so long, you run out of ideas and basically you, give, you end up giving away everything that you've learned. You can do that over the space of fucking 10 years if you're uploading fucking once or twice a week. It's going to happen eventually, and then what happens? They end up scraping the barrel, and then they end up doing reviews, and they end up doing paid content. They get used to the monetization, and a channel that started off as a pinnacle of audio education just turns into fucking audio QVC. And due to the way that the YouTube algorithm works, they need to keep in the eye of the curator, which is the algorithm, so they keep pumping out and pumping out and pumping out and pumping out. Unfortunately, they've run out of ideas, so what have they got? Reviews! <laughs> That'll do! That's what everybody wants to watch! Quality! And that, sadly, is YouTube now. It's just, it's just, we're all content machines, you know what I mean? We're lacking personality, we're lacking opinions. It's almost like we've forgotten what it's like to be fucking human beings. Because that's the way that our audience sees us. They see us as content machines. Fucking pummel it out, pump it out, pump it out, keep me entertained, or I'll fuck off and go somewhere else. That's the difficulty now. That's something that I've always tried to keep on my channel is, you know, me, <laughs> is not lose me and not lose my opinions and not lose my honesty. Yes, I might piss you off sometimes. Yes, I might come up with some controversial shit. Yes, you know, sometimes I might make stuff that you don't like, but it's a, coming from a fucking human being that's wanting to be an actual audio engineer. However, don't get me wrong, over the years my channel has become slightly more compromised. I have done the odd paid video. I've done sponsored content. 
you know, and I've had to think a lot about what my audience wants and what works well on YouTube, not what I want to do, what works well. I've fallen into, you know, a trap quite a few times of easy content. You know, shit content that I've been like, oh my God, I'm, it's because I'm the plugin guy. It's like, if I do a top 10 or something and I'm just like, yeah, these are plug... I actually had two videos where I was talking about plugins that I'd reviewed and I was like, oh, let's review me reviewing stuff and you just fucking lapped it up. But I don't want to be that way. And, you know, as I fucking speak about fucking people making paid content and it dumb and dumb YouTube, I'm doing a paid video next week <laughs> for real phones because I had to finish the studio. And I was like, shit, I need the fucking money. However, you know, I only did it because I use real phones. Like, I've been using real phones for years. So it's, any, it's a win-win for me. However, what I am going to say to you right now is that I understand that reviews and paid content is dumbing down the audio community, and I don't want that. So I'm going to make a promise to you right now. After the real phones video, there will be no more paid content on this channel, and there will be no more reviews. This will be a channel following Paul Third. I'm not going to follow you anymore, you're going to follow me. And if you don't want to follow me, then fuck off and I'll see you another time. I don't want to make content that is, you know, revolved around the product. I want the product to be revolved around the content. So, yes, I get it, right? I make, I'm doing a paid video and it is, it's not a review, it's a fucking ad. Let's fucking face it. As much as I use it and I love it and I do think it's the best headphone software that I've used, it's not helping anybody, it's not educating anybody, it's just basically a paid fucking advertisement showing you features of an upgrade of, you know, headphone room simulation software that I use. And it is shit that, like, me and other YouTubers do have to, like, resort to the odd sponsored video to make this fucking financially worthwhile. But it is what it is, you know what I mean? Like, YouTube AdSense is absolutely shit. And there, is, there are times where if I could morally justify a paid video, then I'm like right, okay, I'll do it. But I'll only do it if I feel like I fucking, if I really need the money. Like, I'm not these other big YouTubers that we know that are fucking shell city. I'm not that, and I never have been that. I just see certain opportunities that will come up and I'll be like, right, I use that. I actually like that. I actually want that. And you'll pay me for it to just fucking speak about it. And I get it, and I'll use it. Happy days. However, I understand that's not helping anybody. So as of after the Real Phones video, which will be next week or the week after, that'll be it done. It will all be education. No reviews. Don't fucking bother asking me to review anything. Don't bother. A new plugin comes out, don't give a shit. A fucking new piece of software comes out, a new fucking piece of gear comes out, don't give a shit. Now, many people may argue, Paul, like, look at what, like, Nicholas from Panorama Mastering is doing on YouTube. Like, he's pummeling out content and he doesn't rely on sponsored videos. And look at the growth he's got. Fuck, he's now overtaken you. And look, it's great what Nicholas has done. Like, I've actually been supporting Nicholas, like, since he was, like, you know, like, three and a half thousand subscribers. I remember I gave him, gave him advice. Yeah, it was good. I was, like, I want to say, like, two years ago. And um, we've been speaking for a long time, and I'm very happy for the success that Nicholas is getting now on the platform. However, the issue that we've got when you just kind of succumb to the algorithm, and it's just content, 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 the issue is quality over quantity or quantity over quality. And, you know, that's something that I know that Nicholas has struggled with, you know, slightly. Now, don't get me wrong, Nicholas's content is, is very good. I've had him on the podcast and we speak a lot and I'm very, very, very proud to say that I've got a friend um, as talented and as educated as Nicholas because I do think that a lot of Nicholas's content really does hit a good sweet spot in regards to audio education. But, you know, I'm very honest with Nicholas and, you know, and I've told him, look, you've got to be careful with that quantity quality. Because there is times, you know, where I know that he's made certain videos in this new kind of experience thing that he's going on just now. He's experimenting a lot and, you know, he's putting a lot of content out there and, you know, he's seeing what sticks. Uh, and a lot of it's been sticking. You know, yeah, I think I think you had one video that hit over, like, it was like 70, 80,000 views. It was like the science behind mixing bass or kick or something like that. The reason that I support guys like Nicholas is because he is behind the audio journey. And don't get me wrong, there's other guys than Nicholas. There's obviously the king of the audio geeks, Dan Worrell. And, you know, there's t there is a ton of really good audio YouTubers out there that are sticking to the audio journey. And to be honest, as much as, you know, I would love to just jack in my job and just fucking 
make loads and loads and loads of content and try and, you know, make as much money off AdSense as I can. You know, it works for guys like Weaver Beats and stuff like that. But, you know, I, I, I've got a full-time job and I've got commitments and I only really want to make quality content. You know, that's something that I've always been firm on. Like, to me, quality content is content that's well-researched and, you know, you, you take time on it. Like, a lot of my biggest videos I've taken a lot of time on. Like, I'm very fortunate because I'm autistic, so <laughs> so I can go proper geek mode and I could, like, hyper-focus on things and I can just, like dive deep and find what I need to find and I do lots of fact checking and stuff like that and you know I remember even you know Weaver did a video uh, recently where he was talking about I think people were, were, were wanting him to go back to the plugin police stuff and he was like it's just not getting me the views that I need and I know that he wants to you know do more of the video essay stuff but guess what the video essay stuff takes time and he's a man that's on you know YouTube a lot, Twitch and YouTube, he's on the platform a lot, he's constantly keeping himself in the algorithm. But even that man himself understands that, you know, there's a difference between quantity and quality. And, you know, he understands how to make quality content. I think um, the one that he did on Acoustica was great. Me and him kind of, I released it first and then he released it two days later. He put way, <laughs> way more work than I did. Like, I'd done a bit of research and stuff, but it was like one shoot, done, like one take. <laughs> one take wonder as I always am. Uh, but he took time on it and it came out really well it was way better than my video and deserved to get more views um, than mine as well but they both complemented each other really well and it was kind of the first time that I kind of sat back and was like yeah like Weaver like you could make some really really high quality content and I think that's what he's going to do I think obviously he's in a position where money wise he's got to keep himself in the algorithm and he's got to do what he does that's his thing but even guys like him you know have a battle between quantity and quality and even educated people like Nicholas, you know, struggle between quantity and quality. But it takes time. I don't have time anymore. This studio is just, it's taken up all of my time. And, you know, even all the studio, like people have said to me, Paul, you could have made so much content about your studio. I tried. I, I tried to make like the odd videos, but they just fucking tanked. Because you're not interested, because the truth is many of you watching are like, I don't have a big fuck off studio like you have now. I don't have the luxury of an Atmos room and a live room and a control room. I don't have the fucking funds to be able, to, or like, again, if you're renting your fucking property or you live in the property, you don't have the luxury I do to completely fucking treat this thing. Like, again, I treated it again yesterday. I bought GIK bass traps and I bought, I made bass traps for the corner as well. Like, I, I've just been spending and spending and spending and spending. But I've been learning and learning and learning and learning because I am an audio engineer and I'm an audio geek. And for me to do this whole studio thing properly and to be a professional and offer a professional service, I need to follow the audio journey and I need to keep learning. I'm an apprentice of the audio journey and that's the way I want my channel to be. I want to focus on quality content. I want everything to be quality. I want everything to come from a place of, right, Here's what I have learned this week, this month, right? He, I've done a few mixes and things went shit. That's what Nicholas is doing amazing at just now, where he's genuinely making videos like as he's mastering and mixing stuff. He's like, oh, that worked really well this week. I'm going to share it. That is fantastic content. And that's the things that I really hope Nicholas like keeps on doing. And that's the stuff that I want to do. And that's somebody else that I quite respect is um, Recording Studio Loser. I really, I, I met him in Nam. And uh, it was a really, really humble guy. He, he was so impressed that me and Ed um, knew who he was. He was like, oh my God, Paul Third and Ed Thorne know who I am. <laughs> and we just laughed because we just thought it was, you are just like, ah, oh, really sweet, man. But, you know, I love what he does because, again, somebody that's sharing his audio journey. And I, th I think everything he makes comes from that journey. Yeah, there'll be time that he's fucking talking about fucking expensive gear and shit. But it's stuff that he uses day to day. And people like him and Nicholas are the people that I think deserve to be getting that that climb up the ladder just now. And they're inspiring me to get to where they are. I don't want to be like working a full-time Monday to Friday job that I dislike, <laughs> having to do a podcast and to do YouTube on top of it and fucking try and like get the studio finished. It is now nearly finished. It's 95% finished, just little things. Like I'm going to have to do all of this and then start to get clients and then start to build up the studio name and you know, hopefully get to a point when I can jack in my job and be them, you know what I mean? Like, I could, like, use YouTube as a luxury and do it just because I enjoy it. We need to stop the product being the reason why we make the video. 
as I said earlier, the product should always follow the content, not the other way about. And also, if we're going to stick to quality versus quantity, you know, another issue that I feel that, like producing tons and tons and tons of constant content, even though it's not paid, you know, the issue that comes with that is misinformation. Because if you don't have time to fact check your shit, then you're just going to be constantly, you know, like producing and churning out like a ton of shit, just like stuff that isn't fact checked, isn't well researched, and is actually hurting the industry. It's, you should never be giving your audience bad advice, but bad advice is what all I've been seeing over the past three, four years. That's, you know, one of the reasons why I decided to make the channel was because I was like, had so many questions and I dive deep and be like, that's bullshit, and that's bullshit, and that's accepted, and that's accepted, and why do we all believe this, and why do you believe that when it's bullshit? And then I went and done all the science and proved a lot of stuff. Like, I have debunked a lot of shit, as well as guys like Dan Worrell and a few other creators. But we're very few and far between, and I know that's the content that, like, has made me very dear to some of your hearts. I mean, some of the comments I get and some of the messages I get are, are unbelievable. Like, I, when I was at NAMM, I was shocked at the amount of people came up to me and was just like, man, thank you so much, man. I fucking appreciate you, man. Like, I've learned so much from you, man. I even went to, like, a YouTuber night and, like, fucking everybody knew who I was. I was like, what? This is weird as shit. And, you know, like, I could tell people really appreciated what I did. And I say did because, as I said, I... I let myself slip, you know what I mean? My content has been going down because I've been struggling to deal with time management. I've been struggling to deal with just doing everything, like being a man that thinks he could, you know, hold everything on his shoulders and work 60, 70 hours minimum. <laughs> a week, that's what I do. I do like 60, 70 hours minimum. It's to hardly spend any time with my wife and my kids. Um, and my wife is super, 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 super patient. And she understands that, you know, I do it because I need to do it, because I need to work. This is my passion. However, I'm not directing my passion correctly. I should always be making content that I fully believe in, because I do genuinely believe that that's the content that the audience, you watching this, will get the most out of. And to be honest, I don't give a shit about politics. Like, see the whole Dolby Atmos thing? It's really, really fucking pissed me off, because the amount of misinformation that there is on the internet about Dolby Atmos. And why is there so much misinformation? Because, unfortunately, everybody hates Dolby Atmos. And as long as the piece of content that they're watching fits the narrative that they want to go down, then they're like, yeah, I don't give a shit, there's loads of misinformation, but there is. Like, actually, I would say one of the biggest videos about Dolby Atmos in our community is f fucking filled to the brim with misinformation. The guy that made it, I think he said he's never even listened to Dolby, <laughs> to Dolby Atmos. He's just spoken to a few people saying to people that, oh yeah, it'll cost you upwards of 40 grand and stuff, but mine's cost under seven, sounds fucking amazing. And it shocked me how many people have messaged me privately to be like, Paul, like, why are you going down the Dolby Atmos route, man? Like, yeah, it's fucking all about that, man. You're fucking working for the man. I'm like, I'm an audio geek. Mixing immersively, I mix immersively in fucking stereo. That's how I think. I'm interested in it. And I'm going to go down that rabbit hole and learn everything that I can about it because I'm interested. I'm, I love music and I fucking think Dolby Atmos mix is done well. Like, completely surpassed stereo. It's fucking amazing. Now the room's calibrated and stuff. Oh my God. Like, I've I had to stop myself going in the Atmos room because I just end up spending, you know, hours after my work listening and my wife's like, that's tea. What did you do? Did you, did you get your video done? No. You were listening to Dolby Atmos mixes, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. Paul, what are you doing? Um, you're researching about Dolby Atmos, aren't you? Maybe. And that is something that I want to keep. I know you don't like Dolby Atmos and you'll have your opinions about it, but I'm interested in it. And that's it. There is no political shit going behind it. I invested in it because I was interested in it and I think I could make it work. If it fucking fails, it fails. What's it fucking going to matter to you? But I'm passionate about it and I'll make content about it. If you don't want to watch it, like I said earlier, fuck off and I'll, and I'll meet you again another time. But what I'm not going to stand for is people accepting misinformation because it fits a certain narrative or opinion. No matter the opinion, you should always give the correct information at all times. And that's another thing that's been dumbing down the community because you just believe shit. Like the amount of times that you know, I've proved that a plugin is just completely linear and digital. There's nothing analog about it. The Harrison channel strip, and people were still like, Yeah, it's definitely analog. Yeah, I could hear it. Yeah, I don't care what the graphs say. 
We don't, we don't, we don't mix with our eyes. Mix with our ears. Mix with our ears. <laughs> when the science, <laughs> the science tells you that it's just completely a digital fucking plugin. Jesus Christ. And, and I'm still up against it. You know, I, I will do blind A-B tests with analog versus digital and people like won't pass the blind test <laughs> and still say, no, I could, I, I could hear it. Yeah, analog's way better. Yeah, way better. And that's probably the biggest reason why, you know, Plugin Doctor is so despised within the audio community because the audio community is scared of Plugin Doctor because it's scared of science because it's scared of things that it doesn't understand. Because the audio community is slowly being dumbed down. You're more willing to accept that things are true just because somebody's got a fucking few Grammys. And Plugin Doctor is definitely something that I want to go back to because I didn't realise like the amount of shit that I caused with it. <laughs> and I didn't realise the amount of people that I got actually using Plugin Doctor. And again, what I didn't realise at the very start was how Plugin Doctor and using scientific tests really fucks up the chain and the way things work. See, the thing is with Plugin Doctor, honestly, Plugin Doctor, if like utilised correctly and you understand it, right, and that's another thing, people use Plugin Doctor and don't understand it, then give misinformation. I like to think that I know Plugin Doctor pretty well and I've learned it a lot over the years. But what Plugin Doctor can do is genuinely ruin an entire chain of release day videos. Like loads of people coming out going, yeah, 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 so it does this and it does that because that's what I was told to say. And then somebody like me comes along being like, no, nope, doesn't do that, doesn't do that. Actually, it does that. Actually, that's broken. And actually, that does that. Hmm, that said that it does that, it doesn't. It's not actually faithful. That's not what the analog does. And then all of a sudden, these YouTubers get pissed off at me because, <laughs> because they look like shells or they look like you know, fucking idiotic fucking reviewers, you know, people that have just taken something at face value, created surface layer content, just been like, yeah, take that, give me my views, thank you very much, and I'll see you next week. Plugin developers hate it because, you know, guys like me and Dan Worrell have kind of shown the way of how to test plugins and how to see what's actually going on. And that's why certain bigger audio YouTubers have tried to discredit Plugin Doctor over the years, especially one that owns a plugin company and would rather you uh, go through uh, free EQ cheat sheets and, you know, magic fucking EQ frequencies instead of actually finding out how stuff works. And that's why I've always leaned on Plugin Doctor and Science because I understand that from an engineer's point of view, I don't have the credibility. I don't have the, the credits or the, the, the working experience of other guys on this platform. But what I do understand and what I have at my disposal is science. And you can't beat science <laughs> in many, many, many cases. And, you know, that's something that I've built my fucking career on is honesty and transparency. Even when I do paid stuff, you know what I mean? I am always honest and transparent and I always tell them if I find something, I'm going to show them it. I think I get frustrated a lot because I get tired of people constantly DMing and like commenting and like private messaging me to ask me Paul, should I buy this? Honestly, the amount, that's probably the biggest question <laughs> that I get asked year in, year out. Paul, should I buy this? Especially headphone amps and plugins. Like, my God, especially fucking headphones and shit. Paul, is this headphone amp good enough? Is this interface good enough? Is this headphone good enough? What do you think I'm going to do? And guess what? Fucking muggins over here, right? The guy's got no time because I always feel like I want to help people. I fucking muggins, I'll go online, check the specs of the stuff that they're asking me to do, do all the work for them to go back to them and then fucking basically hold their hand and say, there you go, there's my advice based on the science, now make your own fucking decision. Uh, but but what, what, what would you do? I'd go for that one. That's what I'm buying then. Cheers, Paul. And it just turns into this fucking cycle where like you can't make any decision for yourself. When you're buying stuff, you need at least four people <laughs> to confirm that you should be buying it. I don't ask anybody's opinion when I buy something. I do my due diligence <laughs> and I research and then I'll buy it or I'll get it, I'll test it and if it's not good enough, then I'll fucking hand it back. I don't, I don't struggle from confirmation bias, I would like to think, because I'm so scientific. And that's something that I've tried to install in people. I've tried to give you the tools to go, right, you don't need me. Here's all the information, just go out and do a bit of fucking research and you'll know whether you want to buy it or not, whether or not it's going to fit your needs. If it is going to fit your needs, then fucking, you know, see if you can get it, get a buyback or get a refund policy, buy it, listen to it, do a few proper tests and if it's for you, then keep it. Job done, you don't need me. But I feel bad when people contact me because they're like, 
they're like damsels in distresses. They're like, oh my God, oh my God, Paul, I need your help, bro. Like, I need to know which interface to buy. Like, oh, I bought this fucking interface. Is it good enough? I bought this pair of headphones. Are they going to be good enough for mixing? <laughs> like, Jesus Christ, just train your ears. <laughs> like, again, I'll say it again to the people that have contacted me and I, I have helped. Fuck it. I would say over a thousand people. Easy. Easy. In the three, four years I've been doing this. It's a lot of people. Easy. I reply to nearly every fucking people that message me. And I shouldn't, because, like, I've got a wife and kids. But, look, all I'm saying is you don't need me. Like, you do not need me. This is why the audio community is getting dumbed down, because you can't make your own decisions. Like, do you know that when I make videos, I intentionally leave certain things out, because I know if I leave certain things out, people will comment, and that'll give me more engagement. <laughs> I've gotten to the point where I understand that, you know, my audience is kind of... Look, and I say this with love, but some of you are just fucking lazy, man. Right? I know that some of you are lazy, and I know that if I leave stuff out, you'll be like, oh, Paul, 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 well, what about this? But what about that? When you could easily just do a bit of research, it'll take you five minutes. But the way that we are on YouTube just now is the audience is like, no, 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 no. You tell me everything I need to know, and that's what I do. Everything. You tell me everything from start to finish. It's not my job to fill in the gaps. It's your job to give me everything that I need to do, and that's what I'm going to do. And that there lies the biggest issue. It's really sad to say in 2024, but it's genuinely true. A large portion of the audio community genuinely rely on, you, on YouTubers to tell them what to do. Just let that sink in. You rely on YouTubers to tell you what to do. And guess what? Loads of audio enthusiasts know that and have figured out that if they make lots of fancy short fast food like mix hack videos, as long as they get the engagement and they get the clickbait right, they know that they can grow an audience. They don't give a fuck about the audio journey, they don't want to do any of the hard work. They just want to make content because they understand that if they make content it gets them engagement, makes them feel better about themselves, they can grow a following and they understand that sadly these days subscriber counts matter more than credits. Again, I'm going to say it, but it's really sad, but that is genuinely the way it's going. And what's even scarier to guys like me is that I'm seeing way more kind of AI-generated channels with like AI-generated voices. Like nobody's on screen, you don't even know who the person is, and the whole content just seems so robotic. And what I find interesting is that a lot of these channels are all using the same plugins, or from the same plugin developer. And that then makes me think, right, so if we all get used to this kind of churning out this fast food hacky fucking, you know, surface layer shit, essentially, that's being, you know, sprayed about, pissed all over the audio industry, what stops plugin developers and audio manufacturers making up fake channels that are almost like AI generated, just using their products, masquerading as, you know, wannabe fucking audio engineers? I already can see some of them like, why are you only using Waves? only always use Waves. You only use that brand and you only use that brand. That's the way it's going to go. That's why we need to keep the humanization part of YouTube. As soon as we allow AI and fake fucking personalities to take over, it'll all just fall to shit. And it's already fallen to shit, but it's, to me, it's just going to crumble and it's just going to fall into the hands of the people that are all about that. And many people may argue, yeah, 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 but there's lots of beginners out there, tons of beginners out there and they need like this content so they can learn. Sorry to tell you, but like Produce Like A Pro came out fucking over 10 years ago. Audio University, I would say Kyle is probably the best at taking such complex um, topics and like delivering and breaking everything down in a really easy to understand manner. He's one of the best at it. And if you're talking about like beginner mixing tips, Sage Audio has completely <laughs> milked that cow dry. <laughs> They've done a video on fucking every beginner how-to that's based anything with mixing and mastering. They've covered everything. There is no need for you to come like down as this fucking YouTube audio messiah. They're all there. They've all done the content. It's already out there. So to summarise, what can we as content creators do to stop the dumbing down of the audio journey on this platform. Number one, stop acting like mixing authority, especially if you don't have like the experience or you don't have any credits or you're not even a fucking working engineer. Like just don't do it. Like don't waste your time. Instead of making content about other people's journeys, focus on your own journey, which brings me to number two. 
Start making content about you and your journey and your mixes. I understand that it's hard to put your mixes out there. Me and Ed know firsthand <laughs> from the working audio tools. Like me and him go head to head and constructively, you know, compare and critique our own mixes. And I'll tell you one thing right now, it does sting. You know, see when somebody's like, oh, don't like that mix. Oh, Ed's mix is way better. This Paul's mix is fucking way better this week. Oh, I would have done this. Mm, I think that's a shit mix. Some people could be brutal. But at the end of the day, you should never be falsifying who you are. If you want to, like, be the best that you can be, your credibility has to come from your skill set and your work. Your portfolio not your content, right? Your portfolio shouldn't be fucking mixing videos and how many subscribers that you've got. Your worth should come from your end product, which is not YouTube videos. It is mixing, mastering. And that then brings me to number three. Stop pushing plug-in presets in like big massive fucking plug-in chains. Just stop it. Like it's too, it's really dumbed down. I've kind of already touched on it, but again, I'll, I'll reaffirm how important this is. Please let the real professionals share their journey, right? Stop regurgitating stuff that you think is fact. Let the people do it themselves, right? That's why on the Working Audio Tools, we interview these people and we talk all about the audio journey from start to finish. We talk about where they started. We talk about that we go deep. We're like, well, well, how do you do that? We don't just go, which plugin did you use in which setting? Right, how do you do that? What's your methods, your techniques? Where did you learn that from? We go into the business side of it, the psychology side of it. There's so much things that are untapped in those interview episodes. But guess what? For whatever reason, like they get like, lucky if they get a thousand views. And I'm like, hold on. <laughs> a guy that's got like over a hundred thousand fucking views has got, isn't even getting fucking industry fucking top 40 mixes <laughs> in their portfolio right now. They're just doing fucking YouTube, basically. You'd rather listen to him than listen to somebody like Tura Medina, right? A guy that's like one of the Latin mixers right now. Prezi, for example. Like, we had Ill Factor on, right? That was one of the best interviews I've done in terms of like music producers discussing the future of music production. It's like, like the amount of stuff that me and Ed learned. Like every fucking interview we do, we're like, wow, we learned more about the audio journey. And we ask them questions. We're like, okay, I'm struggling with this. Like, what do you do? What's your method, your approach? Again, the layers, peeling back the layers. And unfortunately, you know, that's just something that I've came to accept that many of you value subscriber growth than people that have got actual working experience right now. I just accept it now, you know, I find it f hilarious because the amount that I've learned from my mentors in the industry over fucking certain big YouTubers out there is, is unbelievable. Like, I don't learn anything from these fucking fast hack things, like all the shit surface layer fucking content. I don't learn from it. And I know that you aren't learning from it because you keep watching it. Like, if you were learning from it, you would be a great mixer and you'd be like, I don't need you anymore but you still need them. Why? Because the content itself is shit and surface layer. It's not giving you enough. It's not allowing you to make your own decisions. And why is it important to make your own decisions? Because, <laughs> think about clients, right? Think about a client, right? A client comes to you and is like, I want you to mix my stuff. And then you put all the presets in, do all the tricks, and they say, that's some fucking garbage. I need you to fix that, and I'm not happy with that. What do you do? You need to learn how to make your own decisions and how to problem solve and how to troubleshoot. Because see, when you can make your own decisions, purchasing decisions, mixing decisions, just fucking decisions in life, you'll be amazed at how less insecure you are and how much more confident you become. We need less surface layer content. We need less laziness. We need more people to enforce to everybody watching that if you want to make it in this industry, you need to put a lot of work in and you need to Focus on the audio journey. The audio journey will never change. Everybody, every big audio engineer that comes up and makes it big, the people that you want to mix your record, they have that audio journey instilled in them and it's there and it's something that we should never lose. We need opinions. We need personalities. We need to share our, our fallacies. We need to share our faults. We need to be humble and we need to be like, you know what? I did this. That was really good, but this was really shit and then fix it and go, look, I fixed that. And be like, ah, if I fixed it, you could fix it. This might help you. Look, this was a problem I ran into, but we don't do that anymore. We'd much rather show our best side. That's what it's all about. It's all about looking good. We can't ever look shit. 
I, I know it's tough, trust me. Like when you've had a few mixes on the, on the working audio tools and you're like, oh, that was a bit shit. But then see when you get a great mix. Like I had Emra um, message me about, I don't know, I want to say like two months ago. And there was one, I think it was the Will Fraby mix that I did. And he was like, bro, that there is a fucking great mix, bro. That there is something that would definitely get accepted. If you were to send that to a label, that would get accepted. That's the mixes that you should be doing. Great mix, bro. And that meant so much to me because when I sent a mix to, <laughs> to Emre like a year and a half ago, he was like, bro, this is a fucking terrible mix. <laughs> it fucking destroyed me. But I needed that. And that's what we need more of. We need more honesty. We need to be able to fucking take stuff on the chin and get back up and dust ourselves off and not be afraid to take another hit again and be able as a community to say, you know what, this is tough and this isn't easy and you need to put the work in. Just remember, you are responsible for your own audio journey, nobody else. You stay in control, you knuckle down, you do what you need to do, and you will get to where you need to be. Trust me, believe in yourself, believe in the journey, don't be afraid of hard work, don't be afraid of getting fucking punched to the ground, get yourself up, dust yourself off, and you will do what you want to do. There you have it, bit of positivity to end that <laughs> fucking shit show. However, there it is. My name's Paul Third. I'm done. I'm going to fuck it. I'm done. Ah, oh, fucking hell, it's a long video. Yeah, I'm done. Paul Third. Fucking. I'm out. Right, go, go. No, do, no, do as we, do, do we as fucking want. Right, fuck is. I'm fucking done. See you later.